There you go. There's a point in the Fargo Season 5 finale where the pacing feels off. Most of the major storylines have been resolved, but a big chunk of the episode's runtime is just sitting there waiting to happen. How you feel about what happens after that is the make or break point of the season, and I think if nothing else it makes that creative choice an interesting one. I wasn't able to do a video about the ninth episode, but the main thing that jumped out at me from that episode, which played more as a part one of two than as a standalone, was that we were seeing three victims of Roy's abuse and the different ways they reacted to it. Not because there's a right way to do that, but because there is always a price that has to be paid, and it's all held together by violence. With hindsight, Gator's time in the ice fishing shack is a great way to illustrate the whole process in a short amount of time. He's trying to survive, so he cycles through all the different ways he can think to appeal to Munch, who he sees as his executioner. None of them work because there's no flexibility in the Sin Eater's code of honor. This inflexibility is maybe the only thing that Roy and Munch have in common. And if you think about episodes 9 and 10 as a two-part finale, that's bookended by two people trying to change Munch's mind. As it relates to the life of abuse he was born into, Gator internalized it. He believed that if he could become what Roy wanted him to be, he would be accepted, and then the pain would make sense. This led to his choice to go after Munch, and ultimately left him eyeless to pay for killing the one person we'd seen Munch connect with. Karen appears to accept Roy's violence as part of her duty as his wife. Basically, she does what she's supposed to according to his twisted sense of morality, and she's repaid for that by his almost complete indifference to her. Dot, of course, chooses not to be a victim, choosing to fight to get away instead, and her defiance is so unsettling to a guy like Roy that it consumes him to the point that he's willing to risk everything to deny her her freedom. And she knows this, so she spends her life looking over her shoulder. So with that and everything else, what I went into this finale wanting to see more than anything was Roy being brought to justice and Dot making it back home to the life she created with Wayne and Scotty. And not just to get back the life she had before she was kidnapped, but to a new life where her past wasn't haunting her. Roy believed she owed him, and with this debt she would never be free. And debt was a major theme Fargo's fifth season explored, so it was fitting that the finale asked us to consider what can be done about it. Not just the question, isn't it the moral position to forgive debt sometimes, but how it affects us, and how that shapes us and how we interact with the world around us. So in the end, the things I wanted to see all happened. The FBI's raid on the Tillman Ranch was successful, and Dorothy makes it home. Roy was caught sneaking out of the escape tunnel we saw Gator slip out of a few minutes before, and promptly taken into custody. The fact that the cover was put back into place was the giveaway, and the FBI is happy to let Roy know that it was his son that tipped them off. There was a cost though, and no I'm not talking about Odin's pretty fantastic death, which was the first hint that the end of the standoff was coming sooner rather than later. Whitfar was able to honor the debt he felt he owed Dorothy for saving his life, but ultimately lost his in the process. I don't think we got to know Wit enough for this to hit as hard as it might, but we knew him enough to know he was good and believed in the idea of justice. He would have survived if he shot Roy, and I think it would have been justified given the circumstances. But similar to Danish, his mistake was that he was looking at the situation through his own point of view. He didn't realize that all bets are off when you're up against a foe who doesn't give a shit about the rules. It adds a bit of tragedy, and it adds to the shock that Roy will feel later when he finds himself up against the same kind of foe in Lorraine. In a season that's been about the crushing effect debt and abuse have on people, I can't imagine it's easy to find a way to have the queen of debt exploit a bunch of prisoners so they'll violently abuse someone. But here we are. Lorraine came around on Dot, so that's part of this. But Roy took someone she valued unequivocally in Danish. So it's not surprising that she would throw her weight around to exact some justice of her own. The weight in question is real in this case. 
She uses her pool with the Federalist Society to make sure he'll never be able to get anywhere with an appeal. And she uses her money to pay off the debts of the prisoners he's locked up with, adding a little extra in their commissary accounts each month to make his life a living hell. She wants him to feel everything his wives felt. Every blow, each humiliation, and the fear. And while there were a few occasions in the final two episodes where we saw him show concern, I do believe this is the first time we saw him look scared. Gator and Karen are both likely to be doing a fair amount of time, although they may have been offered some reduction to their sentences for testifying against Roy. Gator and Dot share a moment before she goes back to Minnesota, where he gets to apologize. He's a despicable character, but also never really had a chance. You can't help but think of him putting his head on her lap during the puppet show. And think about how they were both kids when they met. She came into that situation, but it was all he ever knew. He asks if she really saw his mother, and she explains that she thought she did, but now she knows it was just a dream. And then she agrees to visit him in prison and bring those oatmeal raisin cookies he likes. And that's something. When Dorothy returns home, she not only has the very excited Wayne and Scotty waiting for her, but also Lorraine. Their reunion is a much different affair than their introduction in episode 1, and we saw the first part of Lorraine's evolution in their phone call in episode 9. I enjoyed that she congratulated her for shooting Roy in the stomach, and that even though she accepted the hug, there's only so long she can put up with it. From there, we go forward one year to see Dot and Scotty run into Indira at Witt's grave for the anniversary of his sacrifice. I wasn't a huge fan of Indira becoming Lorraine's new right hand, and I imagine this scene was intended to pack an emotional punch that didn't really land for me. It does work to set up the end in a way, though, because after this and Lorraine's visit to the prison, I wasn't sure how they were going to fill up the last 20 minutes. Looking at it now, it makes perfect sense that Munch would show up. But at the time, it also made sense that their last encounter in the mist on the ranch would be the last time they saw each other. The reveal in everything else Wayne does in this sequence is perfect. In my mind, he is one of the season's best inventions. And even though this scene didn't delight me in the same way it seems to have done for a lot of people, the Wayne of it all kept me in it. This is a good thing because, as I said earlier, it's a really interesting creative decision. Old Munch, a character who is so much fun to watch that you almost forget that he makes his living as a hired gun, believes that Dorothy owes him a debt. Because we know this comes from his inflexible belief, it makes it a lot of fun to watch Dot turning things around. When she asks him why it has to be that way, he starts to fill in the blanks about his history. And while it's a compelling story that is being told with an implied this is why I have to kill you vibe, it's a school night and the lions are halfway to dinner. After she tells him that people always say you have to pay your debts, but what if you can't, and makes the case that forgiveness is the more humane choice, she tells him that he better get to killing or wash his hands and help with dinner. And he chooses the latter. Maybe only because he wants to finish explaining himself, but the lions aren't about to let that happen. He tries to bring up the code, and that gets brushed aside for a lesson in making biscuits. After they sit down, he does manage to clarify that he's immortal, and explains how the flashback to whales we saw played out. He tells her he was getting by eating the fleas off rats before a rich man on a horse came to offer him two coins and a meal. He continues, but the food was not food. It was sin. The sins of the rich. Greed, envy, disgust. They were bitter, the sins. But he ate them all, for he was starving. From then on, a man does not sleep or grow old. He cannot die. He has no dreams. All that is left is sin. Before we get to her response, I think it's important to remember that supernatural elements are pretty common in the Fargo TV show. Season 4 had the ghost, Snowman. Season 2 had its UFO. And season three had Ray Wise's character who showed up to talk to Nikki at the bowling alley. So at this point, this is just part of the DNA. Dot takes an understanding approach to season five's supernatural element, saying, It feels like that, I know. What they do to us, make us swallow like it's our fault. But you want to know the cure? You got to eat something made with love and joy and be forgiven. Then in a way that looks like he was embarking on a path that he'd never considered, he takes a bite. That's followed by a genuine smile that doesn't just say, wow, that tastes good, but one where you can see the forgiveness taking hold. So what does that mean? 
Well, I mentioned a couple of times that I thought this was an interesting choice. And that's because in Munch, we had a character that wasn't interested in redemption. He was a force to be reckoned with. So when he shows up at their home looking to collect, there are only two things that can happen, usually. Dot kills him and we're happy she survived. Or he kills Dot and his nihilism wins. The code is upheld either way because it's how a character like that engages with the world. By having Munch move in with Irma, the show established that he isn't beyond wanting to have different kinds of relationships with people. And therefore, it's not unbelievable that Dot would be able to get through to him. So my take was that the show was looking at those two choices and rejecting them. Dot's refusal to be a victim didn't really secure her safety any more than Gator's pleas got him mercy from Munch. Roy couldn't make the choice to let Dot go, and he'll have to deal with the consequences. Munch could make the choice to forgive himself, but since he's beyond redemption, the idea has to come from someone else. And the notion in and of itself isn't enough, or it shouldn't be. So the fact that he made the biscuit with her help to feed himself and her family, pretty much the opposite of what he does at his day job, and the fact that it's given as a token of the release from debt without expectation of any repayment, well, that adds up for me. So bring on the smile. I think that's pretty neat, and that's how I felt when I finished the episode. It didn't really hit me in the heart, even though I came to care about the characters that were sitting at the dinner table. But it kept me thinking about how they got there, and what the creators were trying to say, and the possibilities that open up for them. I imagine that Munch will just stop by to play sock hockey and watch Real Housewives and the like from now on. After I settled on that, I did read the Noah Hawley interview in Hollywood Reporter where he said he was basically trying to flip the scene from No Country for Old Men, with Kelly McDonald refusing to call it when Anton Chigurh flips the coin. He said, I thought about that and about Dot and this idea of debt. She took something from Munch and now he wants something in return. But when the time came to write the scene, I thought there was certainly a thriller version of the scene. One last fight or chase or whatever you want to call it. Then I just thought, well, what if she refuses to be in that scene? What if that's his scene? And she's like, well, I'm not going to be in your scene. I'm going to make you be in my scene. And my scene is a school night where we're halfway to dinner. So either do what you're going to do or wash your hands and help. And yeah, that works too. And overall, a great season of Fargo. Another great cast, and I don't even really feel the need to elevate any of them above each other. I mean, it's just consistently good. Of course, it is dot season. That is part of the idea going in, was that he was thinking about the wife in Fargo the movie and saying, what if we told her story? And Juno Temple rose to the occasion every time they asked her to. And I think that is the secret ingredient in this finale working. You have to want for her to succeed and believe that she's capable of getting a different outcome than Gator did. I haven't seen much of the fan response as I'm writing this. I had the sense that it might be divisive whenever I watched it the first time. But I clicked on IMDb to check something else and saw that it was ranked lower than episodes 8 and 9. Which led me to believe that some people might have been disappointed because they were expecting more of a high-octane battle at the ranch for Roy's last stand. Can't blame them if they did. It is Fargo. And that wouldn't be any more out of place than The Supernatural is. And the show is good at overt, gory violence, so I kind of get it. But hey, there is a lot of implied violence in debt. That's how it works. The banks might not come to break your legs if you don't pay on time, but they know you know that they have their ways. And just like abuse, debt follows you, and somehow you end up thinking it's your fault when it's not. The moral position used to be that usury was one of the most detestable and unnatural sins you could partake in. And then people like Lorraine switched it around so that the moral position became that you should always pay your debts. And I think that's a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.